for Gateshead for ensuring that we had this very important debate today. So many members wanted to speak, but they were unable to be able to do so. And I do think, Madam Deputy Speaker, that it is a shame um, that they're unable to participate remotely. I think the government is a little bit more focused on subverting democracy than protecting lives, but we won't go into that. I mean, the government's decisions are increasingly logical and irrational. And this government finally, though, did a U-turn um, and uh, just the other day. And now children will be fed this summer, and I'm glad the government's doing U-turns. And I want to thank everybody involved, including the APPG uh, group, Marcus Rashford, and he joined celebs like Raheem Sterling, John Boega, and others finding their voice and using their position for change. Madam Dis Deputy Speaker, this debate on how COVID affects BAME communities is a sobering debate. We all watched the brutal, very public lynching of George Floyd. Our lives were interrupted by the killing. But racism doesn't just manifest itself in these brutal ways that can be caught on camera and shared on social media. I can't breathe the last words of George Floyd. Those words could apply to the disproportionate number of black, African-Caribbean and Asian people dying from coronavirus in this country. Madam Deputy Speaker, every time the government gets dragged kicking and screaming to do the right thing, I can't breathe. I can't breathe every time the government hides a report or kicks an issue into the long grass by announcing another commission or another report. I can't breathe. My breath is taken away by the lack of care empathy and emotional intelligence shown by this government time and time again. For months we stood at our doorways and clapped for our key workers, the ones on the front line, the doctors, the nurses, the carers, the cleaners, the ones driving the buses, the cabs, the forklift trucks or serving people in supermarkets. The people we clapped for are the ones who are being underpaid and the ones who are disproportionately dying. The death rate of COVID-19 has exposed and amplified what has been going on in society for decades. The concentration of deaths in areas where people are just about managing should actually worry us all. As a country, we are better than this. According to the Office of Natural, National Statistics, the burden of COVID-19 has been felt more strongly in regions with greater deprivation, those that are dying for COVID-19, they are dying at double the rate of those in more, more affluent areas. And according to the Office for National Statistics, adjusting for age, black people are more than four times more likely to die from COVID than white people. Pakistanis and Bangladeshis are more than three times more likely, and Indians more than twice as likely. BAME people account for 13.4% of the population, but 34% of patients admitted to the intensive care units. In my constituency in Brent, sadly, we have the highest number of registered deaths in London. And in line with the ONS findings, the areas of greatest deprivation, like Harlesden, has the highest number of deaths. I thank Mara Brofran for giving way and for the powerful way in which she's making these crucial points. Would she agree that the approach taken by my colleague, a constituency colleague, and our Welsh Health Minister, Vaughan Gething, on the very issues she mentions, the disproportionate impact on the BAME communities uh, in Wales that we've seen in my own constituency and tragic deaths too, um, has been in stark contrast to the approach that we've seen from the UK government. He's got this issue and he's led on it from the start. Yeah, I thank my honourable friend for that intervention. And in fact, there's lots that we can learn from the approach in Wales and what they're doing and how they're approaching the disproportionate deaths of COVID-19 on the BAME community. And I thank him for everything that he does in his constituency and on this issue. Madam Deputy Speaker, we didn't get to this point by accident. So we need to make a concerted effort to dismantle the structural and systemic racism that exists in society and affects life chances from the moment you are born. And I tell you this, structural and systemic racism is a health issue too. The Institute for Fiscal Studies reviews, reveals... Um, the Honourable Lady needs to come into the body of the chamber soon. If swap round, that's it. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. 
Thank you, my honourable member. I spoke to NHS doctors from the organisation Every Doctor who have told me that 63% of BAME doctors felt pressured to work in wars treating COVID patients compared to their 33% of their white counterparts. Does the honourable member agree with me that the government does, must do more to address workplace discrimination in, um, to ethnic minorities? I thank my honourable friend for that very important intervention and I will be coming to that uh, lower down in my speech, but I think it's important that as constituency MPs and Eric and Tensmith that you talk to doctors and we understand and learn what's going on and I wish that the government would take that on board too. Thank you. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, as I said, structural and systemic racism is a health issue too. And the Institute of Fiscal Studies reveals that jobs which are most at risk are overpopulated by African Caribbean and Asian and minority ethnic people. We must be honest with ourselves and ask, why is that? The higher BAME death rate is apparent across all grades of the NHS, even in the highest socio-economic groups. And we have to be honest with ourselves and ask the question, why is that? If we shy away from the truth, nothing will change. The publication of the first report where 17 doctors died, 16 of them were BAME. The Eastern Eye then reported that since June the 2nd, when the report was published, another 18 doctors have died, saving lives, and 17 of them are BAME. We must be honest with ourselves and ask why is that? The PHE report the government tried to hide states that there were numerous examples, as my honourable friend uh, just intervened, that were not able to access appropriate PPE to protect, protect themselves adequately. It also stated that requests for risk assessments or additional PPE by BAME workers are more likely to be refused or requests were less likely to be made because of fear of adverse treatment. Mary Agiwa Agipong, a nurse, was still working at a hospital when she was heavily pregnant. She sadly died of COVID-19. They managed to save her baby girl by emergency caesarean. This is so tragic, but we have to ask ourselves, why was she forced to work? A couple more examples, two more, two black employees in London, a taxi driver and one transport worker, Belly Manjinga, have now died after allegedly being spat out by somebody who proclaimed they had COVID-19. Belly had an underlying health condition and should not have been in, put in danger. She requested to work in the ticket office, but that was refused. We have to ask ourselves, why? Was that happening? And we need the government to urgently ensure and implore all employers to do risk assessments in all workplaces now. Because as lockdown is eased, those most at risk are in danger. They're in greater danger unless the government introduces structural and requirements from employers. Important that when she talks about employers carrying out risk assessments, that that includes government departments and includes the government's outside contractors, because uh, my honourable friend will be aware that many of these outside contractors, cleaning for example, uh, many of the workers uh, are from the BME community. I thank my honourable friend for that intervention. It isn't one rule for the rest of the country and another rule for government department or parliament. We've seen that play out way too often. Your honourable friend is absolutely right. It has to be taken into consideration. More than two in 10 black African women are employed in health and social care roles. Indian men are 150% more likely to work in the health or social care roles. And 14% of doctors in England and Wales are Indian. COVID-19 doesn't prefer one person's lungs to those of other ethnicities. It's not the pandemic that discriminates, it is society. It is almost as though being black is a pre-existing condition that results in worse outcomes for health, employment and education. It does not for one moment, Madam Deputy Speaker, mean that it cannot be overcome. It is not a victim mentality that has put us in this situation any more than it was indolence that put British citizens on planes and deported them during the Windrush scandal or bad sportsmanship that subjects our players to abuse on the field. We must call it what it is. 
Because if we don't call it what it is, how can we identify it? How can we cure it? How can we stop it? It is racism. And it has become more structural and systemic. And it's not just about individuals. Structural and systemic racism can exist without individual acts of racism. But it is an unfair, unequal, discriminatory system. And it is literally killing us. I'm grateful to her for giving way. Does she agree with me that at the heart of government there's huge ignorance on this agenda and what we need is the government to learn from what's happened and as we ease lockdown the government urgently needs to do the risk assessment so that families who are at risk, intergenerational living and all those issues are taken into account and action is taken to protect people from further risks of dying. I thank my honourable friend for that intervention and it's absolutely vital that the government ensures that risk assessments are carried out in workplaces so that we can have less and fewer deaths. As I say, Madam Deputy Speaker, it is literally killing us and just like the killing of George Floyd, we can all see it. And if you don't believe me, if anyone doesn't believe that structural racism exists, believe the body count. Incremental changes are no good if structural barriers still exist. Breaking down systemic and structural barriers will build a society that's better for everyone. Every life matters. Of course it does. But not all lives are treated equally. Interestingly, some of the things that would most benefit and uh, save black and Asian lives are the same things that will save everybody. Risk assessments, tests, trace, easy access to in-date PPE. What the country needs now is a government that's going to deliver fast and decisive actions. Everyone in this House should stand up and say, no longer should discrimination, cultural exclusion, poverty and class be allowed to determine whether you live or whether you die. And this is why this debate is so important. It is said that if a house is on fire on the street, of course all houses on the street is important. But the focus needs to be on the house that is burning. And right now, this situation needs fixing for the BAME community. Right now, we have a group of people who are dying at four times the rate of anybody else. It is the same demographics of people who have died in Grenfell Tower just three years ago. It is the same group of people who were subjected to the hostile environment just eight years ago. And it is the same people who have been told to stop being victims. There is a pattern here, Madam Deputy Speaker, and we need a government to show some urgency to address the racial inequalities that exist in the UK. At first, the government said, we will not publish the PHE report because it's too sensitive around the Black Lives Matters. Then on the 4th of June, the minister stood up and said, we asked Professor Kevin Fenton, a black surgeon, to lead on this review. But apparently, he didn't lead on the review. The minister then said the review was not part of the report. Confused? I know I am. The minister also stated that PHE did not make recommendations because it was not able to do so. But we know that the minister was aware of the second recommendations made by PHE. I wonder, when the minister gets to her feet, if she would apologise on behalf of the government for misleading the House. Why did the government try to bury the PHE report? And I wasn't the only one who was trying to get to the bottom of this. Eastern Eye, Channel 4, Sky, they have doggedly pursued this issue because something just didn't feel right. And this is why people have taken to the streets, because they are tired. They are tired of the dishonesty. The government has a form on whitewashing reports. Baroness McGregor Smith review has had very little progress. The Lammer review has has not had any recommendations implemented. The Race Disparity Audit 2018 not acted upon. Windrush Lessons Learned Review, it was edited, it was delayed for a year. It was published and then sections deleted and it was still not acted upon. Stop trying to erase the injustices towards black and brown people and working class people from government reports. It's a disgrace. The government announces reviews and consultations to get itself out of trouble and then thinks that everybody will just forget as we stumble into the next crisis. We see what we're doing and we're calling you out on it. Because the government produced a document a few years ago which said, explain or change. The government said, when significant disparities 
between ethnic groups cannot be explained by wider factors. We will commit ourselves to working with partners to change them. So I say to the Minister, what's stopping the government? What is stopping the government from acting? The murder of George Floyd, the death toll of COVID, has forced us to have these overdue, open and hopefully honest conversations about race so we can ensure a more fairer and equal society. And Madam Mr. Speaker, as a member of the Science and Technology Committee, I have listened to many scientists over COVID-19. And it's not genetics that have resulted in a higher death rate. So it's not internal, that means it is external. And to back up the finding of the PHE report, the one the government tried to hide, it noted that potentially there is a less severe impact on COVID-19 in the Caribbean, in Africa, in Indian subcontinent. So it raises the questions as to why BME communities in England are so severely affected. They suggest that issues such as structural racism and discrimination and failure to adequately protect key workers may have contributed disproportionately. So I conclude on this, Madam Deputy Speaker. I am pleased that I've got a COVID-tested centre in my constituency in Harlesden that has been so uh, hard hit. And if anyone's interested, they should register with Brent Council. But as we build a better better life after COVID, we must do better. The UN found that the structural socio-economic exclusions of racial and ethnic minority communities in the UK is striking. The minister and the government should be embarrassed. People have always had worse health outcomes. This isn't new. Poor people have always had worse health outcomes. But this virus has magnified the scale of the inequality, colour of skin, economic backgrounds, social and structural racial barriers and infrastructures are all factors as to whether you have a good chance of surviving this pandemic. The killing of George Floyd in the middle of a pandemic is a pivotal moment for the world. I can't breathe is as true for COVID-19 as it is for racism. History will judge each and every one of us. In time, when the world stood still for eight minutes and 46 seconds, History will judge us on our actions, and history will judge the Minister on her response. Minister, before you get to your feet to respond, ask yourself what would be written by your name. How will you be how would the minister She mustn't address directly the minister. She speaks through the chair. She does know that. Dawn Butler. Apologies, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker. History will judge each and every one of us. Before the minister gets to minister's feet to respond, you must ask yourself what will be written. You must ask what will be written by your name. Government ministers are revealing trauma on one hand and then saying racism doesn't exist on the other. I think it's cruel. I don't think the minister should give a speech. I think the minister should list actions. What will the government do? When will the government do it? Tell the House and the country when the government will start to implement the outstanding 150 plus recommendations from previous reports and reviews. Don't focus on the new commission that the Prime Minister mentioned. We know that's designed to agitate and gaslight us, just like the Foreign Secretary's comments on taking the knee. Black Lives has more in common with white working class people, with LGBT plus community, with people who are underrepresented than this cruel government. In the words of the the late amazing Joe Cox, we have more that unites us than divides us. So I stand to tell the government that we are done with the games. We are done with the platitudes and we are done with kicking this issue into the long grass. Enough is enough. Now is time to act. Now is the time for action. Now is the time to get the government's knee off the neck of the black, African, Caribbean, Asian, minority ethnic communities. The question is, as on the order paper, Caroline Noakes. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I would like to congratulate the Honourable Lady for Brent Central for having secured this